Hello. I wanted to finish up our previous lecture with uh, the second part on the Constitution. When I left off last, we were talking about uh, the, the need for the Constitution because Daniel Shays had scared the bejesus out of the 13 states when he and his farmer friends had started acting crazy in Massachusetts because of the low farm prices and the high taxes and then their farms were being foreclosed on and everybody was getting their freak on. Well, before I get into exactly what it is that they decided to do and how they decided to proceed with the Constitution, I want to talk to you about what were the philosophical underpinnings of the Constitution. And to do that, we need to kind of go back to the beginning of our notes on this section. And we need to talk to you about a gentleman that became very important to the Americans, as important as John Locke was to the Declaration of Independence, a gentleman by the name of Edmund Burke and another one by the name of Charles de Secondat, known as Baron de Montesquieu, these two men are going to be very, as equally important to the Constitution. Okay. Now, before I get into Edmund Burke and Baron de Montesquieu, I want to tell you that John Adams was not at the Constitutional Convention. He was in Great Britain and he was our ambassador to the, G the G King James Court and Thomas Jefferson was in Paris and he was the ambassador to Paris. And when, one time when I was at a, well I was in Massachusetts at the John, at a John a Adams conference, and I was learning under Dr. Mark Landy, uh, who's absolutely brilliant, just an absolutely brilliant political science teacher. Uh, I think I asked, don't you think it was good that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were not there? And he said, you know something? I hadn't really thought of it that way, but yes, you're right, it's absolutely not. And I'll come to tell you that in a moment. Uh, but basically is that the two of them couldn't come to an agreement on a very important subject and there would have been a lot of fighting. You've already seen Adams and what he can do when he is addressing people. So there would have been a lot of nana 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 going on so Jefferson is known as the father of the Declaration. Well, it is James Madison that is known as the father of the Constitution. And perhaps no one in our country knew better about the affairs of state and political affairs than James Madison. The only other person I think was his equal was John Adams, but John Adams just, when he dug his heels into something, he couldn't let go. Okay, well, who's this Edmund Burke fella? Edmund Burke was from Scotland. He was a politician and he was a philosopher. And he was also a Whig member of parliament and well, what is a Whig member? Well, he wasn't a he wasn't a Tory. He was not a Royalist. He he was someone that came up with a philosophy, if you will, the modern the beginnings of the modern philosophy of conservatism. Well, now wait a minute. Conservatism's always been around, Miss West. Not like this. Not like this because he also believed in natural rights. 
He is a combination of somebody that believed in classical liberalism with tradition, and that's a difference, okay? John Locke and Thomas Jefferson believed in natural rights and the general idea of a generational social contract. Adams, for all of his vitriol about Burke, agreed with Burke that a, con a social contract or a constitution or a social compact was not generational. He believed it had to be connected to the past. So let me explain it to you like this. Burke looked at Locke and he said Locke was wrong. Locke was completely wrong. That the social contract or our constitution, it was, it didn't go far enough to Burke. Locke was wrong and so was Jefferson. It was not just for the living, but our contract went to, had to go back to people that had been before us and it had to be passed down to the people that were coming after us. Well, why is it? You know, even Jesus says you're free to remarry what your, once your husband's dead. And, and the reason this is, is because that Burke says, look, Everything is based on a foundation or a precedent of some sort. You can't just make things up. You can't just make them up out of thin air and think like you've uh, created it. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And it's true. Even these ideas of uh, having natural rights that come from God's creation these things weren't necessarily new they were built off the backs of the Greeks um, almost every concept of government and the beginnings of human nature came from the, the Greeks um, the first legal ideas came from the Babylonians even though they were harsh and favored the rich and of course men but there was an idea that there was a written code and that you knew what the laws were and you had to follow them. Um, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Hebrews, that was supposed to apply across the board. But, of course, there were also laws that were added in because people kept complaining. And for Burke, what he wanted was a government that was flexible that will, would allow change over time. He saw revolutions as bloody and messy and that they would cost a lot of money and they would do nothing but cause tumult in society. So he wanted Americans or any country to it to be the last resort, not the first instinct, which is why he gave so many speeches to the Crown and to the Tories in Parliament supporting the Americans and saying, look, you're taking away their natural rights as Englishmen. And you can't keep pushing people that far. Eventually, they're going to break. Well, I have to tell you, eventually and reluctantly, he came to support the American Revolution. Now, he never did support the French Revolution because he realized it wasn't about restoring natural rights. It was about tearing up an entire government. And you, if you ever get a chance, read his reflections on the revolution in France. He said you wanted to begin anew. You began an, again ill. He said Yes, your walls were in need of prepared, but you had a foundation. If you couldn't find anything in your near past, like your parents or grandparents, that you found so disgusting, why not go back to the Greeks? There's, there had to be something there. But no, you wanted to rip up the entire foundations and start over from scratch. You wanted to reinvent the will. You can't do that. He said they, sh they set up shop without capital. In other words, they, they opened up a business 
with no capital and no merchandise. It was an empty store, and they expected people to buy from them. It was a very interesting essay. He predicted the reign of terror, too. He knew it was going to happen. But here's something else. Not only did he believe that we should base our present day on all the achievements that our forefathers and all the sacrifices that were made. And believe me, those sacrifices, they mean different things to different people. Okay? There are a lot of men and women who have died so that we can have the right to vote. And that means different things to different people. There are men and women who have struggled to get us the help that we have needed and that we so that we could achieve things. My mom for three years never had a day off from work. She couldn't afford to pay for my way to college, but she kept a roof over my head and she fed me. And without her doing that, I, I wouldn't have been able to go to college. That's sacrifice, people. I have a, a, a bachelor's and later on a master's and halfway through a second master's because of the sacrifices my mom made for me. Okay? That's sacrifice. She made those sacrifices for me and for my brother. Okay? There are different ways that people make sacrifices. Okay? So, not only do you need to remember the sacrifices made by those that came before you, but you also need to pass down to the future generation a better world than you came into. You know, I've said this in class, and I'll say it again. I've, I've, I've only ever met one person that said something crazy about her kids and grandkids. We don't ever say, well, I want my children to have to wallow and suffer. You know what? Uh, I, I just, I think it'll help them learn. This is just crazy. We don't do it. We go out of our minds to spend all kinds of money on stuff for them for Christmas. Stuff they don't even need and won't even appreciate six months later. And then we get mad at them. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's not so much about the stuff we get them, but maybe it's about we should focus on the world we leave behind for them. And that's what Burke would say. What is best of the world that you have? That's what you need to focus on. Leave that best of the world for them so that their future is not worse off, but it's better off. And that doesn't mean iPhones and great tennis shoes or uh, PlayStation and Xbox and stuff like that that they're going to be tired of and want something new. But it means about having more opportunities to go to college, having better opportunities for jobs, not having as much debt to pay, and things of that sort, so they don't have to start life from behind. That's what Burke would tell you. Well, that's all nice and this and so forth and so on, and that's great, but uh, this change over time stuff, well, uh, that's nice and all, but how did that help the slaves? How, how did that help the women? How did that help the Indians? Sounds like a bunch of crap to me. Look, y'all, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that I'm making an excuse. I, I'm not. Look, Condoleezza Rice put it best when she said that slavery is our birth defect. It is. The founding fathers kicked the can down the road. John Adams, when he tried to stop Thomas Jefferson for taking that slave language out, that Rutledge threatened them, he said, we will walk out and you will not get it. Franklin said, we will never end slavery unless we get independency. Independency now, slavery later. Well, Franklin, one of the last things he did, with, and he did it with the Quakers, was introduce a bill, the first bill into Congress to abolish slavery. 
It didn't happen, of course. We had to fight a bloody war. But the point is, change over time did happen. I wish to God there hadn't have been a war to have to bring it about. But as Lincoln put it so eloquently, and, you know, if God chooses this war to go on until all the wealth raised by the bondman is taken away by the blood of every man that's fighting, are we to judge the ways of God? And that's it. So, these changes, the government would see them. They would not be reactive, but they could see the changes, make the laws, and things would change over time. And that's how this Constitution was going to be approached. And I'll talk to you about Baron de Montesquieu in just a minute because he was very important when it came up to setting up the Constitution. So, there is 55 delegates. They arrive on May 25th, 1787 to amend the Articles. And of course, Rhode Island, once more, is not going to play the game because they're like, hey, um, you know, we're not going to send a representative. We're going to get ripped off. Washington was there. Ben Franklin was there. Madison was there. And here's something you need to know. The first thing they did was they ordered that the Constitutional Convention that all the records and all the dealings of this Constitution be kept in secret. Now you can say, why those SOBs? Why'd they do that? Well, I'll tell you one reason they did it was they wanted everybody speaking their mind and saying what they thought, and they didn't want it getting out and scaring the people. They wanted people to say their mind. They wanted those delegates to say exactly what they thought. They wanted everything out on the table. And they didn't want to be scared to say what they really thought because they wanted it out there. Look, Patrick Henry was so mad and Thomas Paine was so mad that they did not even come. Thomas Paine says, I think I smell a rat. These men were classical liberals. They believed in the articles. They believed in state control. They didn't they 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 knew that they were going to be giving up a lot of freedom to have this constitution. So what was at the heart? Why did we need this? James Madison was trying to strike a balance of having a federal government that was strong enough to keep the nation secure and have power enough that could unite the nation, um, raise money when needed, uh, without having to beg for money in case there was a, a military attack. And yet, for the states, to keep as much freedom as they possibly could. Now, the first major battle that they had was over representation. How are we going to get representation into the House? How are we going to get representation into the, sit the Senate? And they wanted it to be bicameral. And that was what the first uh, plan called for the Virginia plan or as other people called it the large state plan. Now this was basically that the new Congress would be bicameral and it would be based on population. Well you can imagine Delaware's reaction and New Jersey's reaction. You can imagine this. Heck, you can imagine New Hampshire. You, you, you can imagine Connecticut. 
they were like, no, 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 no. You're going to try and run us in the ground. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay? Forget it. So they countered with unicameral and population, uh, not and uh, everybody gets equal representation. And of course, the people of Virginia are like, that's got what we got now, and it ain't working. <laughs> So that, you know, here comes the screaming and the yelling. And so Washington's like, man, this is coming. This is coming undone. So he gets with uh, Madison. He says, look, James, you got to come up with something, would you? Because this is falling apart. We got to make it work somehow. So Madison and Franklin put their heads together and they come up with what they call the Great Compromise and here it is. We have a bicameral which means two houses. We have a House of Representatives and we have a Senate. And in the House representation is based on population and the House members have to come up for election, all of them, every two years, and they're directly elected by the people. In the Senate, each member has one six-year term, and then they have to be reappointed, and back then they were, they were appointed by state legislatures. The government would nominate and the state would go ahead and approve who the governor nominated or they would tell the governor to put somebody else up. So that's what would happen. Now then comes the South and the South say, well, you know what? We want our slaves to count in our population. And the North just looked at them and laughed and said, look, you don't even call them citizens, you don't even call them people, and you want them to count in your population, forget it. And this is one of the most unfortunate things in our history. They basically come up with the idea that a black person is three-fifths of one human being, and they call it the three-fifths compromise. And unfortunately, the truth is, that's what they do. Three-fifths compromise. So it takes two black people to equal one person. And they give that to the South, and they let that count towards representation in the House. <coughs> but this is what I mean about change over time. They only said that slavery could continue in other words we only could bring slaves from Africa or from Spain or whatever not Spain excuse me Portugal for 20 more years so it could only continue until 1807 that's it and that's what I mean by change over time the only new slaves after that would be slaves that would be from reproduction by slaves here. We couldn't buy any more from any other country. And the idea of that was you if you want your slaves to count as part of population, then you gotta you we're you gotta give us this compromise. And the hope was that after a time that there would be a a, a, a decrease in the slave population and that maybe it might die a natural death. Now, let's look at the idea then. How do we share powers between the federal government and the states? And here's where the Bar Baron de Montesquieu or Charles de Secondat comes in. He was a Frenchman and of course he had the whole French Revolution just was like mind-boggling. And so he admired the British system of where they had a parliament and a monarchy 
and they had a judicial system. Now, he didn't like the, the idea of an absolute monarchy, believe me, but a constitutional monarchy. Well, we weren't going to have a king here. So what Madison wanted was an executive that could be checked but could still have power, and this is very important that you understand this, the most power that the president has is in foreign policy. Absolutely. He has the power to appoint people to his cabinet, to appoint judges to federal benches and to the Supreme Court, and in foreign policy. Generally speaking, unless the president absolutely abhors a legislative bill that is sent to him, he he will he you know he will usually sign it, especially if he knows it it he, it, it can't be overridden. Like in other words, uh, he can uh, he won't veto it if he knows that Congress has the numbers to override his veto. If they can't do that, then you know he 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 can veto it. Um, and the only time he does that is if he really just finds it abhorrent. It is in these two ways to appoint, advising the consent, and appoint his people into his cabinet and, and the federal judges, but mostly as commander-in-chief and in foreign policy where he has his most power. The legislature... The legislative branch has the power of the purse. They have the power to make laws. That's what they're supposed to do. And over, over the years, the legislative branch has given it up because they run for re-election. The House every two years, the Senate, one-third of the Senate every six years, and in the middle, you've got the President at four years. They want their seats. They want to get re-elected. So they'd rather have the president make these decisions than them. It is sad, folks, but it is true. They have given up their powers to the president to let him do these things. Do you know when the last time was that we actually had a declaration of war? It was World War II. Yes. We, we don't have to, we don't, the president doesn't even have to ask for a declaration of war anymore. He can go and act unilaterally and then I think it's like within six weeks he has to go to Congress and give them a report and a justification. So for six weeks the president can just go blow things up. I digress. So the executive branch would be a president for four years and a vice president would preside over the Senate. And the vice president does have an important power. He can break ties. If it's 50-50, 48-48, he can be the one that can break the tie in favor for the president. Um, the judicial branch would interpret the laws and I'll come to that in a second. The Constitution says very little about the judicial branch because, frankly, it scared the, the it just scared the crap out of them. They believed they didn't like it. Now, Alexander Hamilton said, "Oh, you don't have anything to be afraid of. It'll be the least political of all the branches." Well, ha 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 ha. Hamilton was wrong about that. We all know that. It is as political as any of the other branches. And they get appointed for life. Believe me. They get appointed for life. So it's ridiculous. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So they just said that there needed to be a law to create a Supreme Court and some federal districts. And they were supposed to do that. This happened... When the, Judici the Judiciary Act of 1789 was created, it created a Supreme Court 
with six Supreme Court judges and several district and federal and circuit courts and finally and there was only three there were only three cabinet positions this created the fourth the attorney general and in the constitution there is secretary of treasury secretary of state and secretary of war and with the judiciary act of 1789 there was the attorney general the idea was each branch would provide a check and balance on the other but it wasn't just that Here's where federalism comes in, okay? We are also going to have to share power with the states. The states have a say in this. And Madison did believe in what he called nullification. He created, he believed that the states were creating this federal compact, and therefore if they didn't agree with the law that the, that the federal legislature passed, that states could not go along with it. They didn't have to. They said, this is wrong. It's not right. It's unconstitutional. And Madison, e Madison wrote the Virginia Resolutions, and he said, hey, I wrote this thing. I should know if it's constitutional or not. Uh, and we'll get into this when we talk in Unit 3. Now, the president could veto something he didn't agree with, but as I mentioned, it t the Congress can override the veto with two-thirds. That's not always easy to get, believe me. And the same thing could happen down on a state level. Um, now we're going to come to something that's the, really the thing a lot of you want to know, and that's about the Electoral College. You want to know, why do we still have this edifice of, of just ho horrible, uh, that the, that the president didn't believe in the riffraff and they should vote because they thought we were a mob and we were stupid. Well, that is one of the reasons why they had it. Yes, indeed. It wasn't really until 1824, eight, you know, 28, that they really did start counting um, the popular vote and into, into the election statistics, believe me. Part of it was Look, you had people like <coughs> Madison and Adams and Washington. They had seen all the effigies. They had seen all the things that had happened. They, they also understood that a lot of Americans, even though there were more Americans that were literate that, than, that, that, than in Great Britain, they were not all, not all of them were. And that they were they were voting a lot of times with emotion, which means anger. And so they, you know, they didn't want people being seduced by a demagogue and voting for somebody that was crazy. So they wanted a filter there, a filter to sort of weed out some of the crazy people. And the second reason was this, okay? And a lot of people don't understand this, but Madison did. He also understood that we needed help for the small states, those states that had three electoral colleges. I mean, excuse me, three electoral votes, four electoral votes, six electoral votes, Alabama's nine electoral votes. If you didn't have the electoral college, it would only be the large urban areas where populations were 8 million, 6 million people. That Those are the only pl places the presidential candidates would campaign. They would go to New York City. They would go to Chicago. They would go to Atlanta. They would go to Orlando. They would go to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. They would go to... Dallas, Texas, and Fort Worth. They'd go to Austin. Um, they would go to Detroit, maybe. They would go to Los Angeles, San Diego. They would go to Seattle. They would go to the major urban population areas, Denver. 
they would never even step foot in our state because they wouldn't have to. They wouldn't step foot in Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota. You might get them in the Tri-Cities in, in Minnesota, I guess. You know, you might could get them into Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. You, you, you know, I guess. You, I guess you could get them into Cleveland and Ohio. I don't know. But there's so many states that they wouldn't even... Kansas, forget about it. Nebraska, forget about it. You know? Indiana, really? You think they'd go to Indiana? No. Delaware, uh-uh. Yep. Maine? I don't think so. And so they'd only go to the large urban cities and they'd get out their vote. And so all the small states suddenly would have nothing to say about who got elected. That's not fair. You could conceivably win the presidency with eight or nine states if you jacked the vote up in those states. And that's all. And if it was based on the popular popular vote, seriously, how would you feel if a person won nine states and another person won forty one states and they didn't get elected? I don't know about you. I'd feel a little pissed off because forty one nine, forty one nine, forty one nine. I, I I feel a little pissed off. Okay. The Constitution is ratified. Everybody began to get get there. Delaware was the first, and then Pennsylvania, and everybody was waiting to see what Massachusetts did. And to their shock and because remember Adams is not there leading the charge Massachusetts passed it one by one once Massachusetts did it and ratified it it all click 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 and Rhode Island was the last holdout uh, Washington was elected president John Adams was selected vice president and George Washington has the, is the only president that has the privilege to be unanimously elected president of the United States. So here comes Adams, bless his heart, back to uh, New York. And that's where our first capital was. And then we moved to Philadelphia and then we moved to Washington, D.C. And we'll talk about all that next. And you'll see John Adams just can't get out of his own way. Anyway, I hope this has helped. These are the things you really need to focus on. And I hope this has helped. Anyway, I will see you guys. <coughs> Excuse me. In class on Thursday. Bye.